Hi, I am Paul Jaffe of the Naval Research Laboratory, and I'm going to talk to you today about power beaming and space solar, two distinct but potentially transformational technologies that we are starting to see some momentum for. <clears throat> All right, so let's start from the beginning. What is power beaming? Have uh, have a definition for that. So I am defining power beaming as the delivery of meaningful amounts of energy without moving or employing mass between the transmitter and receiver. So there are some subjective words in there. Obviously, uh, meaningful might be in the eye of the beholder. But let's take a look at what this might look like. So in, in many situations, we have a hard or expensive place to get energy. This might be a distant facility or a flying drone or a similar situation. In every case, there always exists a comparatively easier place to get energy, and often these places are separated by a, a distance or separation that is ill-suited for a physical connection. Enter power beaming. And this obviously is not going to be the best solution in every case, but in certain ones, it may be the only solution. So here's, if we take that sort of three block diagram and expand it into a little bit more detail, we can have a functional diagram like this that shows how power starts from an input source, is converted, goes through a transmit aperture, through some transmission media, to a receive aperture, is converted, and then applied to whatever our load, our application cases, and I've called out in blue here a number of different measurements of interest. Obviously, not all power beaming links are created equal. Some might be for great distances. Others might be for large amounts of power. And there are different aspects of the system that we can look at to figure out how suitable it may or may not be for a given application. And this intends to call them out. I won't go through all of them, but suffice it to say that there's about 15 different measurements that may be of interest for folks who are either implementing or investigating the usage of power beaming. Number of different modalities, I've focused here on those in the electromagnetic spectrum. Certainly you could use acoustics or other waves perhaps as well. Three broad categories, laser, millimeter wave, and microwave. These are the areas of focus primarily because of their transmission quality through the atmosphere. If you're in space, maybe the spectrum opens up a bit because you don't have to worry about atmospheric attenuation or opacity. And even within each of these ranges, there's a different uh, selection of wavelengths that you might use. So quite a few areas where you could use power. Here are a few notable historical examples of laser power beaming. This is definitely by no means exhaustive. There are many more than I've shown here, and even uh, many of those have notable characteristics as well. The one in the upper left was from 2003, where EADS Astrium, a European company, demonstrated laser power beaming to a rover, as you can see in the visible part of the spectrum, and it traversed this simulated planetary surface. In the upper right is a demonstration from Japan in 2007 done at Kinki University where a quadcopter was powered by laser as a way to take a look and uh, determine if there's a need for rescue inside a simulated disaster response area. You can see the, the buildings underneath the drone. And then in the lower left is a demonstration from 2012 at the University of Maryland where the wavelength 1.5 microns was used, which is notable for its eye safety qualities. And this was over about a quarter of a kilometer from one building at the university to another. In the bottom center is a demonstration that was performed by Laser Motive, now known as Powerlight Technologies, where power was beamed to a fixed wing UAV, and in the lower left is one just from last year that was done in Seattle and then replicated also on the East Coast 
at the Naval Surface Warfare Center, Carter Rock, where over 400 watts was sent at a distance of about 325 meters. Again, notable because of the integrated safety system, so that this could be operated without any uh, hazard of uh, eye damage to any observers or users. On the microwave side, the history goes back a bit further. Looking in 1975, which was something of a golden year for microwave power transmission, there was what remains, to my knowledge, the highest efficiency power beaming demonstration that was done in Waltham, Massachusetts, in the laboratories of Raytheon by Dick Dickinson and William C. Brown. In the center, you can see a demo from later that year that was done in California at the NASA Goldstone Deep Space Network facility in which 34 kilowatts was delivered over about a mile. This, to my knowledge, remains the longest distance, highest power, power beaming demonstration that's been demonstrated to date. And then there's been a lot of work on microwave power beaming in Japan with as far back as 1992, flying a fixed wing drone over this sport utility vehicle. And then in 2009, charging a cell phone from this tethered aerostat. And then more recently in 2015, there were actually multiple demos. This is just one of them for microwave power beaming. This particular one being over 55 meters at 5.8 gigahertz and several hundred watts, enough to brew some tea. So what could we use this for? There's quite a few applications, some of which are suggested by the demonstrations, others which might be immediately evident to the viewer or the reader. And those include the ones that concern drones and autonomously and remotely operated systems. There's an opportunity to increase the dwell time, the payload capacity and operational flexibility. And this is applicable to a wide range of different applications. For high altitude platforms, the opportunities are similar and perhaps accentuated because of the limitations they currently have on payload. And then you could also envision a sort of power beaming utility grid that could be set up in an ad hoc ad hoc, ad hoc uh, fashion. As we start to move into space, there's also opportunities to employ this in places like the moon, where we have not only a two week long lunar night, but also where the craters in parts of the moon are permanently in shadow and may contain water and other deposits that would be of interest that we would want to access. So, and again, this is something where there's more latitude on wavelength selection because there's no atmosphere to spread or, or attenuate the transmissions. Here's a little bit more about that demo from last year. You can see the power transmitter, and this obviously was done by laser. The pictures you see show the beam only because they were taken with an IR sensitive camera over a longer exposure. If you were actually at these demonstrations, you would not see the beam at all. And there is a YouTube video that goes into some more detail where you can see the beam if you would like. So to summarize on power beaming, this is an emerging disruptive capability. There's a number of recent breakthroughs in both the RF and laser areas that make this more attractive for some applications. And folks are, are eager, I think, to really push this forward. Perhaps it was former Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering in the US, Dr. Griffin, also former NASA Administrator, who said it best with being able to beam energy from spot to spot in the same way that we use copper wire, that will be very critical. All right, so one of the biggest applications of power beaming is space solar, which most of you, I suspect, are already familiar with. We'll define it just for uh, posterity. Space solar is the collection of solar energy in space and its wireless transmission for use on Earth. And here is one way that it could be done. Sunlight comes from the sun, goes to the satellite, 
is converted, sent from the satellite to the Earth. Now that is not the only way that it could be done. Over the years there have been quite a lot of different proposed ways to do this, as you can see, and there have been many spirited and energetic discussions about the merits and drawbacks of each of these different approaches. And some of these are quite recent, like the Cassiopeia concept from Ian Cash is just within the last few years, and John Mankins has been iterating his SPS Alpha concept as well. So a lot of really interesting and varying implementations for how space solar could be implemented. But at, at their core, they're always collecting sunlight in space and getting to the Earth. Here is a block diagram that's been adapted from John Mankin's case for space solar power book that shows the path of the energy. So we have the solar energy coming in and then the electrical energy coming out to the user and a host of supporting systems and intermediate conversion steps. The solar conversion in particular and the power beaming as well are currently, in my assessment, not at a technology readiness level, TRL, that is at the uh, readiness or scale required. So that's an area which needs some attention. And this stems from a study that we completed last year titled Opportunities and Challenges for Space Solar for Remote Installations. This study has been publicly released. You can download it either from uh, DTIC, the Defense Technology Information Center, or from the National Space Society website where it is also hosted. And we went through to look at the different challenges for particularly remote installations. And I'll just summarize some of the opportunities and challenges that we identified. So, the summary findings include, shockingly, that there are still significant challenges that need to be overcome and that there's investment that can be made in a couple uh, key areas to help address these challenges. The opportunities include the realization of technology dividends. Pretty much everything we've done in space has had some kind of dividend for the Earth, whether it was the initial a space program going to the moon, uh, or many other things that have uh, yielded the benefits for, for the Earth. There's also an opportunity to pathfind future energy architectures. If now we think about the grid as something we can route through the sky or a place that we can get energy to locations that otherwise would have difficulty with that. And then there's an opportunity to establish national leadership. Right now, there's, I won't say there's a void, but there's definitely a unfilled opportunity to become the global leader in this technology. So, plenty of challenges. Technical among, as foremost among them, the biggest thing is just increasing the specific power, the amount of power that can be sent down per unit mass. And there's been limited prototyping. Most of the concepts we talk about require a large area to collect the sunlight and that we're trying to mi simultaneously minimize the mass while increasing the area gives you a solar sail. There's also the question of how these would be assembled and there is work in space robotics being done for that now. Already talked a little bit about the TRL levels. Skip over that. And then here is a log log plot that shows what's been done for power beaming so far. So you can see NASA Goldstone in the upper right there. And the key thing to recognize is only this uh, 1975 fairly short-range demo, less than 2 meters, has demonstrated over 50% per percent end end efficiency. And there's a relatively small number that have safe accessible power density limits. If we shove that into the lower left corner, we kind of see where we would need to get to for solar power satellites including uh, SPS Alpha and Cassiopeia up there and some of the other ones, the SPS 2000, which was proposed for LEO. Also on the challenge side, not surprisingly, economics. This is not going to be cheap, putting a lot of stuff in space, producing a lot of mass, a lot of uncertainty with the energy costs. For microwave power beaming in particular, spectrum is a key challenge. And for both microwave and laser, there's safety and the perceptions of safety. On an operational standpoint, 
there needs to be a balance between power density, safety, and utility. This is the only thing I've underlined in this whole presentation. You cannot simultaneously have a small power density and a high power density, and there's safety challenges for high power densities and operational challenges for low power densities. So you probably have to do something like what we did for the power beaming demo last year, where you have a way to enclose the power beam and allow a high power density that is inaccessible to folks that might otherwise have uh, exposure to it. And then the schedule. This might take a while, right? GPS took a while. Space solar might be like GPS. It might be like fusion. The uh, look at like ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or maybe something completely different. Maybe like the space station or communication satellites. So these were the summary recommendations from the study, and I guess the plan forward would be to keep pushing, particularly for power beaming, the range and power level, as well as being able to establish transmitters and receivers in a variety of different places on the ground, air, and in space, building up to a space-based capability. So to close, you know, history is built on contingencies. Energy is obviously important. As we push into space, we're going to need to have a plan for getting energy there. And there's a real opportunity. So we're course, not the only folks to realize this, Wang ZG, the rough equivalent to America's uh, Robert Goddard, has been quoted as saying, whoever obtains the technology first could occupy the future energy market. So it's of great strategic importance. So I will leave it there and welcome your questions. Thank you.